Hi friends, we are in a series called Stepping Forward Together, the what, who and how of Cedars Church. And really this series is designed to orientate us so that we're clued up on what our church stands for in terms of what we believe, who we are in terms of our identity and what we do in terms of our ministries. So it's divided into three sections. Uh, we completed the first part, we laid the foundations uh, and we're in this section looking at our identity um, in this identity section, we're basically unpacking a mission statement that we have adopted, namely that Cedars Park is a gospel-centred community on mission in Cedars Park and beyond. A gospel-centred community on mission in Cedars Park and beyond. Our core collective identity is found in those 11 words. And today we're thinking about the fact that we are a gospel-centred community on mission on mission, on mission in Cedars Park and beyond. Uh, the Church of Jesus is called to be a missionary church, an outward looking church, and we have our part to play in that. Mission needs to be fundamental to who we are. We need to see ourselves as missionaries in our everyday activities, living lives on mission for Jesus, sharing his love with those around us. Now, before we think about what mission looks like, I want to just spend a bit of time thinking about the foundation and motivation for mission, which is God himself. It's God himself. For God is a missional God. That's the first thing, a missional God. The truth is we are not the instigators of the mission that we are on. We didn't come up with it. It existed long before we were around and will exist long after unless Christ comes first. For mission is rooted in the activity of God. That is what we saw so clearly when we looked at the overall story of the Bible. We saw then that God is our creator and he made us to know him. God made Adam and Eve, our first parents, as relational beings designed to walk in harmonious, loving communion with God and with each other. But that perfect relationship didn't last long as they sought autonomy from God and a relational rift came in. Though they were banished from the garden and God could then have given up on them. He could have said no more to humanity, but he didn't. And really, Genesis 3 onwards is God's mission story of bringing sinful people back to himself and forming a people, a community. That, that mission gains momentum, really, in Genesis 12, when God made promises to Abraham that he would have many descendants and would be a blessing to all. And the fulfilment of those promises comes in the New Testament, when the Father would send his Son into the world to redeem it. God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his Son. That's the story of the Bible. So we see in the work of God the Father that our God is a missionary God. And as I said, that mission reaches its climax in Jesus, as the Father sent Jesus into the world. And Jesus wasn't forced into that. He came as a willing saviour. Essentially, he came as a missionary. He had a mission of restoring broken lives. When Jesus began his ministry, he let people know that what that ministry was all about by quoting the prophet Isaiah with these words, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. That's Luke 4.18. Jesus came as a missionary. We see that time and time again in the Gospels. Uh, one example is with a little corrupt tax collector who wanted to see Jesus but was too short. And Jesus spotted him. Uh, he, he doesn't shout out, Oi, you wicked tax collector, you've done so many bad things wrong. No, no, Jesus calls him by name. His name was Zacchaeus. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down. And then Jesus said this, I'm coming to eat with you, Zacchaeus. And after that, Jesus said about himself, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus came in compassion to seek and save that which was lost. That's such a key text. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And notice he did that in that story by eating with Zacchaeus by eating with him. There's something about eating together that brings people together and strengthens the mission. I'll come back to that a bit later. But that was actually Jesus's main approach for reaching people, just to sit and eat with them. 
So Jesus came as our saviour, as a missionary. We see in the work of God the Son that our God is a missionary God. And of course, Jesus told his disciples that he wouldn't leave them alone. He would give them the Holy Spirit to empower them. And so when the early disciples went around speaking about Jesus, they knew their calling was to speak, but they knew that ultimately they couldn't change people's lives. Only the Holy Spirit can and does do that. So we see in the work of God, the Holy Spirit, that our God is a missionary God. Father, Son and Spirit, this community of persons are on mission, seeking and saving the lost. The triune God is a missional God. And shortly before Jesus returned to heaven, he said to his disciples this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now we see here that our missionary God would continue his mission by using his disciples who would then make disciples who would then make further disciples. This passage is called the Great Commission. King Jesus, the Son of God, is given all authority from his Father and he sends his disciples into the world to make more disciples. They would go as his ambassadors. They should teach everything that Jesus had taught them. That's how Christ wants to build his church. Disciples making disciples. And you notice the promise in those verses that he is with us. He's with us to the very end of the age. That's the promise of the Spirit I just mentioned. We go on mission with confidence because we have the Spirit. We testify, but he also works. So the triune God is a missional God, seeking and saving the lost, and God has chosen the means of spreading his word to use people. Ordinary people like you and me, living lives that are different from those around us, and speaking of Jesus when we have the opportunity. Our missional God calls us to be a missional people. And to be a missional people, we need to have a missional mindset. And that's my second point today. A missional mindset. I wonder what comes to your mind when you hear the word missionary. I think for most of us, when we hear of missionaries, we think of those who go far and wide, perhaps to unreached groups with the gospel. But actually, a missionary is just someone with a mission. And that should be every Christian. So if you're a Christian today, you should see yourself as a missionary. That's why you're on earth, actually. God could have just taken you to heaven, but he hasn't because he wants you to be his missionary. It's been well said that a missionary isn't someone who necessarily crosses the sea, but someone who sees the cross. I'll say that again. A missionary isn't necessarily someone who crosses the sea, but someone who sees the cross. And that should be every Christian. That the spirit of the sovereign Lord who was on Jesus is also on you and me to preach the good news. We are all missionaries. Now, as we hear that, that we're all missionaries, we're likely to have different reactions. One of them, perhaps, is cynicism, because when we hear of of people speaking and preaching the gospel, we perhaps think of very judgmental people yelling on streets, and we think, we don't want to be like that. Well, actually, I think very few Christians fall into that danger. Uh, The temptation for the vast majority of us is actually the other extreme, which is to do nothing. We want to avoid offence. We want to make faith private and individual. But actually, Jesus doesn't allow that. Jesus says that you are the light of the world and a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. We are the light of the world. We are his representatives. Now now that we probably feel painfully inadequate when, when we hear that challenge to be the light of the world. We don't feel we know what to say and we're pretty aware that our lives aren't what they ought to be. So we don't feel like very good advertisements for Jesus. But here we need to remember our message. Our message is this, that we are needy people needing a saviour. We don't claim to have 
have our lives perfect. Uh, we, we don't claim to even know all the answers to everything. What we know is that we are in desperate need of a saviour and Jesus is that saviour. We, we come to God seeking his mercy. That's what we're trying to communicate. We don't communicate to people that we're, we're religious or that we're better, rather that we found one who is. His name is Jesus and our hope is firmly in him. As D.T. Niles said, Christianity is one beggar telling another where to find bread. That is our message. You see, friends, the power is not in the messenger, but in the message and in the spirit of God who takes our words and makes them real. Our job is not to be the source of power, but to be witnesses, telling others what we've seen and found about Jesus to be true. So the gospel doesn't advance because of impressive people sharing the message, but by the Holy Spirit using those who faithfully just share with others the message of Jesus. And we are called to be that people. Despite our unworthiness, despite our lack of knowledge, God wants to use people like you and me to share the hope that we have in Jesus. And as missionaries, we have a mission field and we are called to be missionaries wherever we are. God has placed us in different situations and where you are is your mission field. School gates, classrooms, the office, the boardroom, the gym. These are all contexts for us to live out the mission that God has for us. And we're called to be distinct in those places in the way we speak and the way we act. We need to show concern for others. We need to show integrity. We need to be unwilling to, to gossip. So start where you are, where, wherever you already go. But go with new eyes and a prayerful heart. Lord, I want to be your hands and feet here. How can I show and speak of you in my place, my workplace, my, my hobby place, wherever it is? I want to represent you. And friends, God will put people in your path that you can reach. But it does require intentionality. Intentionality is when you do something with conscious deliberate choice and effort. For example, it means reaching out in warm, kind, practical ways to those around you. Things like getting to know your neighbours, perhaps inviting them over for dinner, or, or, or when you go to a sports club or any social environment, be friendly. And seek to serve. Seek to serve. If, if you've got a friend who's not a believer, reach out to them in, in their time of need in practical ways. Offer to cook for their family if they're ill. Or whatever their need is, look for a way to serve. That is what Jesus did. And we are demonstrating him when we do so. And of course, we need to speak. Pe people don't guess the gospel. Uh, it's, not, it's not something they could work out without uh, God showing it to us and without someone telling them what the gospel is. So, so the gospel is to be told and shared and heard. So we need to look for opportunities to share Jesus with those around us. And as I said, this happens in our everyday lives, family, friends, workplaces, etc. But we are thinking in this message particularly about the fact that we are a church together on mission. So I want to spend the rest of this message focusing on the fact that we collectively as Cedars Church are a missional community. A missional community. Although we're called to do personal evangelism, we're also called to do it together. We are a gospel-centred community on mission. Uh, and there's power in being on mission together. Because one of the things that is most compelling to people who are not yet Christians is to not only see your faith as an individual Christian, but to see the impact that the gospel has on a body of people, on God's church. So we need to see ourselves as not only individual missionaries, but as a team of missionaries. Jesus said this, you are the light of the world, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl, instead they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That is our calling as a church. When Jesus said that, he's addressing a group of people. One person on a hill is not a town. 
A town is a town because it has a large number of people. And as a town, we push back darkness. That's our calling. So we stand out, we're light, and as we, as we let our light shine, it pushes back the darkness. And, and our light should shine so brightly that if it didn't exist, our neighborhood would actually miss us. We want people to see the family of God as a light so that they may see God's work in us and glorify him. And God has given us at Cedars Church a very specific calling here, which is encapsulated in our mission statement that we are a gospel centered community on mission in Cedars Park and beyond. In Cedars Park and beyond. Our main focus for our corporate mission is this patch of land called the Cedars Park Estate. That's our primary focus. But, but we are also wanting to reach beyond. Let me first of all explain what we mean by and beyond. In coming up with this mission statement, we wanted it to be as succinct as possible. But I felt those words and beyond are actually really important. We want to be part of God's wider kingdom work of taking the gospel, not only to Cedars Park, but to the nations. So as a church, God has given us the privilege of supporting missionaries and, and we support them with our prayers and with our finances and we want to continue to grow in supporting them. That's, that's one of the reasons we've, we've started a couple of prayer meetings a year where we just focus on praying for our missionaries. And as a leadership team, we're asking the question, Lord, could we do more for the work of your gospel to the nations? So that and beyond part of our mission statement isn't just a tag on, it's something we take very seriously and we want to grow in. That said, our primary focus for corporate mission is here on Cedars Park. One of the things that excited Lydia and me about this church uh, when we first uh, saw there was an opportunity to, to come and help lead it is that there's a definable local mission field. It's primarily Cedars Park. That's what we're trying to reach. Of course, we, we each have a reach beyond Cedars Park, but our corporate focus, our corporate prayer for a, an area and attention is on a particular patch. It's on Cedars Park. And it's a growing area with growing needs and growing opportunities, which makes it filled with gospel opportunities. And the truth is that to reach this estate, we need to do it together. Now, when I worked on, on that mission statement, I spent a long time thinking about every single word. I wanted the statement to be short, but I wanted every single word to matter, including even those little words which are called prepositions like the words on and in. So here we went for, we're on mission in Cedars. We could have gone for something else. We could have gone for, we are on mission to Cedars or on mission on Cedars, but we went with in. Why in? Because in shows involvement. If we're on mission to Cedars, it can give the impression that we kind of come from the outside, do a few events and it's job done. What we're saying by using the word in is that we're a presence here. We're a gospel presence. We're a gospel presence right at the heart of this estate. We don't just want to do occasional mission, we want it to be a whole life thing. And here we look to the example of Jesus. Jesus came to earth and he took on flesh. The theological word for that is incarnation. He came in flesh, he was incarnate. And there's a sense in which we want to incarnate lives that point to the gospel. We, we, we take up residence here. How do we do that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, relationships are so key in all of this because people are much more open to hearing from those that they know and trust. Here's the reality, friends. People are saved by the grace of God and it's a sovereign work of his spirit that draws him, draws them. He does the work. Yet God's work is often done over time and he works through Christians reaching out to those who are not yet Christians. And as, as that happens, people take steps forward. It, it takes time, though, particularly in our post-Christian culture. For much of British history, people had some sort of knowledge of Christianity. Uh, and so a famous evangelist, someone like Billy Graham, could come over and preach in the 1960s and people already had a framework. They already had a concept of, of God and of sin and of Jesus. 
Uh, and therefore, when someone like Billy Graham came, they could respond immediately. But we live in a time where people don't have that framework. They don't have that background. In fact, they often have many objections to the gospel and it doesn't seem plausible to them and it doesn't seem like good news to them. That means evangelism takes much longer than it did before. Before people even consider the claims of Christianity, they first of all need to see something of its beauty. So how do we go about this? Well, our outreach needs to be flexible and personal and intentional. And in our culture, community is one of the things that, that God uses to draw people to himself. When people see a community changed by the gospel, they have much more openness to hearing the gospel. So what we want is not only for people to get to know individual Christians, but get exposed to the whole life of the church. If we live the way Jesus calls us to, people will see something beautiful about God's church. Uh, this isn't some sort of new evangelistic technique. This is what Jesus himself said. People will know that we are his disciples when we love each other. People will know, says Jesus, that, that we are his disciples when we love each other. Tim Chester says it well, we need to be communities of love and we need to be seen to be communities of love. People need to encounter the church as a network of relationships rather than a meeting you attend or a place you enter. Mission must involve not only contact between unbelievers and individual Christians, but between unbelievers and the Christian community so that they can see Christian community in action. That's such a key part of our mission, friends. Interaction, not just between individual unbelievers and individual Christians, but between unbelievers and the whole Christian community. Here's why. Most people perceive that church is an event that you go to on a Sunday. But when they meet a Christian community, they see actually this is like a family and that draws them. That's why it's so important that we do large community events like the Easter egg hunt and the light party and the Christmas party and carol services. And that's why it's so important we have things like Tots and Youth Club and Connect that meet on a regular basis for relationships to be formed. And friends, it's really important that we invite people. We're not accountable for their decisions, but we are accountable for asking. So let's be a people that invite others to our events and let's make sure that anyone who steps through these doors, Christian or non-Christian, feels really, really welcomed and wanted. And friends, each one of us is called to be part of that. God is a welcoming God and he calls us to be a welcoming people. So church events are really important for reaching our community. But it's not only about organised church events. In fact, it shouldn't be primarily about events. And here's where we perhaps need to grow. Events get things started, but it's nearly always through relationships where the deeper impact happens. So our communal mission cannot simply revolve around Sundays and events. What we need to do more and more is try and find informal contexts where we get time with those who don't yet know Jesus. Paul encapsulates this kind of thinking when he says in 1 Thessalonians 2.8, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. That verse summarizes it so well. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. We share our lives. The disciples didn't have their lives transformed simply by hearing Jesus preach sermons. They had their lives changed by doing life with Jesus. When Jesus said to Zacchaeus that he'd come to seek and save the lost, he also said, I'm going to come and eat with you. Paul modelled that too. He didn't just look for converts. He invested in others and we need to do the same. Friends, God wants you to share not only the gospel, but also your lives. And eating together is such a big part of this. In the Bible, relationships grew most around the dining table, and that's true in every culture, including ours. That's why if we want to grow as a church family, we need to grow, uh, sorry, we need to eat together with one another much more. And if we want to truly re reach out to those who are not yet Christians, we also need to eat with them, spend time with them, whatever it is, wherever it is, get quality time. 
and eating together is such a powerful witness because when we have someone over to, to our house to eat, it models something of the gospel. God is a loving host who says, come and dine at my table. Enjoy being with my people. That's our eternal hope. And, and that's such a big, big part of being a gospel-centered community on mission. We need to see our homes not simply as a place we can retreat to, but as a place for advancing the kingdom of God. And as I said before, when we practice hospitality, we need to let go of the need to feel that everything needs to be perfect. And instead, just let people in, invite them to come and know us as we are. Rosaria Butterfield says it so well, those who live out radically ordinary hospitality see their homes not as theirs at all, but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. They open doors, they seek out the underprivileged, they know that the gospel comes with a house key. I love that phrase at the end there, they know that the gospel comes with a house key. Friends, here I'm not really saying to you that you need to do extra activities. I'm saying you need to be intentional in what you already do. If you're cooking dinner anyway, cook a bit more and invite, invite others to join you. And, and it's not just about what goes on in your home, it's about the whole of life. Look at life as a mission. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So if you're going to the beach, invite your friends, both Christian and those who are not yet Christians, to come along because the interaction and intermingling of our Christian and non-Christian friends is so powerful. If there are people we're seeking to witness to, find ways for them to get to know your Christian friends. Do things together that you'll all enjoy. Because sometimes we have our church friends and our unchurched friends and they never get to meet. That's a shame because there's something really powerful when those worlds start to overlap. It, it makes people think, huh, I, I didn't know Christians could be like this. So how about inviting your friends who are not yet Christians to your home group social? Perhaps even to size well. That might sound a bit radical. Um, but actually, do you know, friends, I've seen non-Christians come along to things like that and be amazed by it. I've seen non-Christians come along to house groups I've been involved in. One of them was a colleague of mine and probably the least likely person I could think of to give up his Friday nights to gather with Christians and study the Bible. I would never have imagined that was possible, but he came and he really enjoyed it. Sometimes people are way more open to doing things with Christians than perhaps we imagine, and we need to invite them. And I think one of the wonderful things about seeing our Christian friends and non-Christian friends connect is that often our, our friends, our Christian friends, are better at some things than us. Uh, and so by having our Christian and non-Christian friends together, uh, sometimes our Christian friends can use their various gifts to, to help your non-Christian friends in their journey. Someone might be good at being hospitable. Some, someone might be a good organiser. Someone could be good at starting gospel conversations. It, it, we work together as the body of Christ as we do mission. And friends, there's something so liberating and joyful about seeking to be God's witnesses to our non-Christian friends together with our Christian friends. It becomes much more of a joy. Friends, as I close, let me challenge you to find ways to reach out. Befriend people. Look to share Jesus with people. Invite your friends over for a barbecue. Whatever it is, find ways of reaching out. Reach out and expect the Holy Spirit to work. And let me also say this as we come to an end. We need biblical metrics for understanding success and failure in these areas. What I mean by that is that success and failure are not about how many people get saved because we don't save people. That is a sovereign work of God. Success is when we live the life Jesus calls us to. When we seek to live on mission for him, Failure is when we don't do that. So if we look at our lives honestly and think, actually, I'm not really living this kind of life that you're talking about, then it's time to step up, to see yourself as a missionary and live like one. Some of you are living this life and you're tired and discouraged by the lack of fruit. To you, I say, take courage, my friend. God sees your heart and your attempts and he delights in it. Keep going, keep looking to him, keep praying, keep reflecting him, keep befriending others, keep speaking of him, be faithful. May the Holy Spirit empower us for this mission as we seek to be a gospel-centered community on mission in Cedars Park 
and beyond.